So, so what you're saying really is, is this, this period of this adolescent period um, is a period where you've got these huge changes mm. that presumably are, are not comparable to other times in, in your life. Yes, yeah, that's what the scientists um, are saying, that yes, we have changes in our um, neural composition and the volume of, of grey matter in different stages of life. Um, and scientists have said that the only other stage of extreme change that's comparable is uh, during the terrible twos, the, the, oh, the really? toddler years. Um, it's quite a good comparison, I think. A lot, a lot of teachers would probably say, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, <makes> <laughs> yeah. In, uh, one thing we, we don't know, we can't say that because there is lots of change going on, therefore teenagers feel very confused. We, we can't make that, that, um, that comparison. But we do know that there is a lot of change going on. And the idea of losing some connections, a considerable number of connections in certain areas of the brain, um, is, is, is a, a, a powerful metaphor for the confusion that we often do see, the confusion and stress and the ability, inability sometimes to make the right decisions um, and do the right things. So as well as those, those changes in volume of grey matter that I mentioned, there are also some other um, changes in what areas we see or what type of activity we see, brain activity we see being used in teenagers doing certain mental activities mm -hmm. compared to the brain areas or brain activity you might see in adults doing those same activities. So um, two areas that are, that are important I think in that and interesting for teachers particularly would be uh, to do with risk taking and to do with social embarrassment. So we know statistically that teenagers are the biggest risk taking demographic. Many teenagers are not risk takers, many people in other population areas are not risk takers either, but statistically teenagers are the biggest risk takers. And risk taking involves wanting to do something, being tempted, being driven to do something, um, followed by using the control area of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, to make a good decision about whether you should take that risk or not, based, for example, on predicting future consequences. So um, I want to do this. I want to do this thing with my friends. I want to do this thing that I know may cause me to get into trouble with my friends. I want to do it because I need uh, status with my friends. I need to be part of that group. I need not to be excluded. The part of the brain that I would then need in order to make me not follow that impulse is the prefrontal cortex. Sort of here. Exactly, right at the front. And it's, it's the last part of the brain to become fully developed. And scientists say that it's not fully developed until on average late in the 20s now. When um, Blame My Brain was first published, so when I was researching it in 2002 and 3, what scientists were saying was that 23 was the age when the prefrontal cortex on average would be fully developed and now they're saying it's somewhat later. What we don't know is whether it's somewhat later now because they got it wrong in the first place and it was always later in the 20s or whether perhaps there is something that we are doing in certain countries that is extending adolescence and there's an argument to be had either way but teachers um, and parents have what they have we can't really do anything about what society is mm -hmm. is doing um, we what we then what we have is um, adolescents whose prefrontal cortexes are certainly not usually fully developed. They are there and it's a mistake for us to think that teenagers don't have a prefrontal cortex or can't use it or can't make good decisions. They can and they often do make really good decisions but um, they are likely to be in a situation where there's a big emotional drive to do or to not do, to, so to, to do something or to be afraid of doing a particular mm -hmm. thing, they're likely to go with the emotion rather than what their prefrontal cortex might tell them to do. So effectively that means that they're perhaps not such good, so good at seeing long-term consequences. Yes. Because they're very driven by this immediacy, yes. this need yeah. for immediate, exactly. you know, relief or benefit or... Yes, and, and I think also it's important when we're thinking about teenage risk-taking, which, which is a big issue for parents and for teachers. We recognise that there is a big 
biological drive to do what your friends mm. want you to do. Being excluded from groups is catastrophic in terms of mental health. It's one of the, one of the worst, one of the most you know, traumatic and common experiences that can happen to people. It's a really big deal. It'll affect how you, how you operate. It'll affect how you can concentrate and everything if you're excluded from groups. And if you think about it, adolescence is about becoming independent. So it's about separating from that secure, ideally secure family mm -hmm. unit that had previously done everything for you, protected you, given you all the rules for living, done absolutely everything. Moving away, separating from that towards ultimately after adolescence being an independent, unprotected adult. So in the meantime, you've got this separating from that security, you've got to make your new, your new groups, your new security. And Adults as well, when we have to make a new group, when we go to a new job or a new, go to live in a new place or something, we need to make our new groups. And we typically modify our behaviour and our values even to conform mm -hmm. to the groups that are there. If we can't, because we can't find any group that, that we can possibly align with, um, then we will be also excluded. And so there's this powerful, powerful biological and, and perfectly positive biological drive to be social, to do things that your friends and peers want you to do. And then the other thing I mentioned was social embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So um, adults who live or work with teenagers will, will often notice and kind of be a little bit um, sniggery and giggling about it, that teenagers often seem to be more embarrassed about a well, anything, what, really. anything, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Something that seems to us quite trivial, mm. something that we would just brush off and we would say, oh, don't be silly, you know, no one noticed and no one cares, you don't worry about it. When teenagers um, are in a brain scanning machine and are asked to imagine a socially embarrassing situation, then the areas of the brain that light up in social embarrassment do so more mm -hmm. and more extensively. There's slightly different areas, um, but, the, but the activity is greater in teenagers compared with adults being asked to imagine the same um, socially embarrassing situation. So what we're saying really is a lot of teenage behaviour or typical teenage yeah. behaviour like risk taking, like social embarrassment, like being very um, beholden to your peers is, is to do with what's going on in, in the brain at that yes, period yes. of time. So it's biological. Really. Yes, yes. Um, and we should also add in something about sleep mm. there because um, we don't know why, there are some, there are some uh, possible theories, but we don't really know why adolescent sleep patterns are different from um, say nine and ten year olds. But we do know, or there is a lot of evidence, that the same sleep changes are mirrored in other mammals. Mm -hmm. Rats and monkeys apparently also have a very short period of adolescence. And during that time, one of the things that, they, that, that will happen differently is that their sleep patterns will change. Um, so adults, parents particularly, will often think that teenage sleep patterns, in other words, not being able to go to sleep at night at the time when the adults would like them to and not being able to wake up mm. um, in the morning, that it's to do with laziness, that it's to do with being on their phones or whatever. Well, it's certainly, although being on their phones late at night is certainly not a good idea mm. for sleep, this problem and these behaviour changes have been evident for far, far longer than um, phones and any other devices like that were, were around. Um, but we know that for some, for whatever reason, as I say, teenagers need more sleep than adults. So they need on average nine Nine and a bit, nine and a quarter hours sleep. And they parents will then think, oh, excellent, that's a good excuse for me to make them go to bed earlier at night. But the problem then is that the um, chemical melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, mm. which the brain needs to switch on at night in order for us to have our, our desired long night sleep, um, switches on at about the same time in teenagers as it does for adults. So quite late at night, mm. you know, 11 o'clock, half 10 to half 11 o'clock. So teenagers are not going to feel sleepy. They're not going to feel ready. They might be tired, mm -hmm. but they may not, they, they're likely not to be sleepy and ready for that long sleep um, until about the same time as adults are. And unfortunately, that melatonin, which is meant to switch off in the morning, doesn't switch off as early as it does 
does for adults. So adults should, when their alarm clock wakes up, wakes them up in the morning, they should spring awake immediately yeah, full of energy and did. alert. <laughs> well, exactly. It isn't quite like that for us. But if it's not like that for us, it's a lot less mm. like that for teenagers who have still, who are still biologically needing to be asleep at that time. So it's not just sleep deprivation, so lack of sleep, it's also um, more like jet lag, it's, it's bordering jet lag in terms of the effects. Mm -hmm. And we know that sleep is really important for pretty much every aspect of physical and mental health and performance um, on you know, schoolwork or whatever work and ev everything, you know, it affects our mood, it affects our ability to control our impulses, not to snap at people, um, our ability to do the right thing, our ability to concentrate, and so really everything that, um, that comes down to being able to function well in the day. So we know it's important, but we also at the same time know, all of us, how horrible it is when we're lying awake at night worrying about needing to get to sleep and knowing how important it is to get to sleep but not being able to. So there's a lot of... Um, education that young people need to take the best steps they can to get the best sleep they can but also teachers need to be aware mm. that this is not a simple matter of just making uh, young people go to sleep go to bed earlier